Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to put in a disclaimer. Nothing I say should be taken as an indication of my aspirations, hopes, or views on this particular subject. <laughs> but it is a very important subject, well worth, I think, having four distinguished speakers come to tell us about. Um, the answer to the question about Brexit and judicial powers needs to be addressed. We are in the middle of an unparalleled constitutional situation. Uh, you could call it a desert. Well, you could call it a desert because none of us knows what the answer is. Um, but I, I think that it arises from the fact that with our half-written constitution, Brexit represents, and I hope nobody thinks I'm being overdramatic, because I've thought about this, and if I am being overdramatic, it's overdramatic and considered. I think it's probably the most important event involving the Constitution and the exercise of the prerogative since Neville Chamberlain told the, the world on the 3rd of September 1939 that we are at, law, at war with Germany. It's worth pausing for a moment. No parliamentary consent to that. It's at least probable, no, possible, I think probable, that if he'd gone to Parliament, he would not have had a vote. Well, we've changed all that. Our prerogative situations change in relation to wars, treaties, and so on and so forth. And that's how this arises. So, when Article 50, I hope you don't mind if we do this by shorthand or we'll be here for hours. When Article 50 is invoked, is that a purely prerogative decision? A partial prerogative decision? Does it, if the end result is the repeal of the European Communities Act, if that is the inevitable result, involve Parliament? Should judges be involved at all? I know there's litigation going on, so the judges will have to be involved. It is, of course, open to them to say, I'm not advocating it, that we'll consider it and decide that we have no power to deal with it. But I suspect that won't be the answer. But is it for Parliament, or is it for the courts to decide this? There's a political question, there's a constitutional question. And depending on which question you're asking, is it political or is it constitutional, you may end up with a different result. There has to be political reality in order for the Constitution to work. So there are some very significant issues here. Uh, we've only got an hour. I hope you won't mind if we transgress over the hour. If you have an urgent appointment at 5.30, please feel free to go, even if we haven't finished. But we have four distinguished speakers. They're going to speak for about 10 minutes each. If you have questions for any individual speaker, could you save it up for the end and ask the questions at the end? And then we can have a discussion in which all of you can join in if you wish. But it won't be a very long discussion. First, I'll ask Dr. Beck, who's going to be who's nearest the lectern. Um, he's a member of the bar at Essex Court. He's a lawyer, a legal theorist, if I give you all the distinctions of all our speakers, that's the whole hour taken up. So do you mind, do my panelists mind if I don't do that? Dr. Beck. Um, uh, just before, I, I have no idea what any of our speakers are doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been told to stand up. I can do no other. That, I suppose, is how many people in this country must have felt about the European Union. Um, now, the Court of Justice, the principal uh, subject of my talk today, has been portrayed and perceived by many as a, as a motor of integration and of where the EU is heading, but many in Britain don't wish to go. EU laws don't mean what they say, but what the court says they mean. This has been the general perception. This perception, a contributing factor to the Brexit decision, is correct, and I wish to explain that this is not accidental, but rooted in the ECJs. I can still call it the ECJ. Um, no point in, in adjusting before it becomes irrelevant here. Uh, the ECJ's distinctive approach to treaty interpretation. I shall, I shall then address some of the issues, um, uh, some of the uh, areas where the court may still be relevant uh, to the exit uh, process. Now, the general rules of treaty interpretation are set out in Articles 31 and 32 of the Vienna Convention on the Laws of Treaties. 
Article 31 states that treaties must be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning of the terms or text of the treaty, in their context and in the light of the treaty's object and purpose. Article 32 then um, contains a supplementary interpretive rule which allows the court to have regard to the preparatory work of the treaty and the historical circumstances of its conclusion as secondary aids to interpretation. Um, now, the Court of Justice itself has summarized its own interpretive approach as follows, quote, in interpreting a provision of union law, it's necessary to consider not only its wording, but also the context in which it occurs and the objects of the rules of which it forms part. Um, in theory, the Court of Justice is bound by the Vienna Convention, and its summary of its own approach superficially echoes Article 31 of the Vienna Convention. In practice, however, the Court of Justice departs both from the letter and the spirit of the Vienna Convention. Based on detailed case law analysis in my um, study of the Court of Justice, I'd like to summarize the ECJ's interpretive approach to judicial uh, uh, decision-making as follows. First, although the court frequently refers to the wording of the treaty or legislation it interprets, the ECJ, compared to many other courts, is relatively more willing to give priority to purposive criteria, i.e. the object's purposes of a provision, over linguistic criteria, i.e. the text. Secondly, the court rarely, if ever, uses historical arguments. So it doesn't do what the supplementary rule of Article 32 of the Vienna Convention asks it to do, namely to have uh, regular regard to the um, uh, preparatory works. The Court of Justice does so when it suits its purpose or the historical circumstances leading to the conclusion of the treaty. Third, the court often and implicitly takes account of so-called meta-theological criteria, i.e. the general integrationist objectives of the EU, and not merely, as it, should, uh, as it suggests in um, uh, uh, its own description of its approach, the explicit, quote, objects of the rules to which a legal, uh, of which a legal provision forms part. Fourth, as soon as the court decides with implicit reference to ever closer union or the principles that favor an integrationist solution, that decision effectively becomes a precedent. In referring back to its own case law, the court thus implicitly also relies on the cumulative weight of previous integrationist decisions. Precedents thus solidify and reinforce the court's communautaire leaning. Fifth, the Court of Justice operates in an extremely permissive political environment. In domestic legal systems, it's open to the legislator to override, uh, to override uh, uh, court judgments by passing appropriate legislation. Judgments by the Court of Justice, by contrast, can be reversed only by the court itself or by unanimous treaty amendment by the member states. So it's as difficult for the member states for the political actors to override a court of justice judgment as it is to effect a treaty amendment. The letter is broadly regarded as, or is regarded as near impossible, so it's as impossible to change uh, 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 the undemocratic judgment of the court of justice. Or, uh, um, sixth, the Court of Justice interprets the treaties as living, not historical instruments. Seventh, in contrast with several other courts applying the Vienna Convention, the Court of Justice does not accept a hierarchy amongst literal, purposive, and other interpretive criteria. Um, 
And finally, the court's variable, variable approach. I say variable approach because sometimes it prefers literal criteria, sometimes purposive, sometimes contextual, i.e. a reading of a provision in its broader legislative context. Um, this variable approach combined with its constant regard to the integrationist objectives of the treaty give the court's decision-making its distinctive pro-union or communautaire tendency, i.e. a predisposition to resolve legal uncertainty in favor of further integration or the union's interests. Now, the court's com uh, uh, communautaire predisposition, uh, of course, varies with the importance of the cases. It's often irrelevant, and it usually is in most of the run-of-the-mill uh, cases which concern the application of more or less clear, detailed, and technical provisions, agriculture, sometimes the environment, um, uh, 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 detailed trade provisions. However, the court's most uh, pro-union default position becomes crucial and often the decisive factor in cases involving major issues of principle, such as constitutional issues or the division of competences between the EU and its member states. Uh, obvious uh, recent examples of uh, this tendency to twist the wording of the treaty in favor of the union's interests are A, um, the uh, uh, decisions of the court on everything that relates to the Eurozone crisis, and secondly, of greater interest in this country, the case law of the Court of Justice on the extension of the right to contributory and non-contributory benefits of EU, uh, EU migrant workers. If one looks at the treaty, uh, there's simply no basis for the conclusion the court reached in um, adding to the substance uh, uh, of the uh, rights of, of migrant uh, citizens. Now, to sum up what I've said, the Court of Justice is and never has been an impartial arbiter when it comes to the interests of the member states and the EU, it may at times defer to member states, yet its interpretive approach is designed to favor integration. So how may the pro-union bias of the Court of Justice affect the withdrawal process during the negotiations and beyond? There are several distinct issues which I'd like to address uh, very briefly. First, what's the possible judicial role in Brexit itself? As EU treaty articles go, and that may be a damning verdict, Article 50 of the Treaty on the European Union is actually uh, comparatively clear, and there's little scope for the Court of Justice to twist, it, uh, to twist its wording to prevent the UK from triggering it at the time of uh, uh, the UK's own choosing. The crucial question regarding Article 50, however, is whether the notification to withdraw, once given, can be reversed. Article 50 is silent on this point, and so the most natural meaning might be that it cannot. However, this is a highly political question. I'm sure the Court of Justice will not block a legal reversal of the UK's withdrawal if all or most member states agree on the reversal. Now, I've recently been to a conference in Italy. There, most of the delegates still thought the UK will never withdraw. It appears from here that this might all be a rather hypothetical uh, scenario. Now, as for the Court of Justice's interpretation of the treaties, while the UK is still a member of the EU, the UK remains bound by that interpretation as it has been so far uh, until the point of withdrawal. Second point, domestic legislation based on EU law retained after Brexit. Uh, after Brexit. This is a more intractable, intractable uh, problem. When the UK finally leaves the EU, the interpretation of EU-based domestic legislation is transferred to the UK courts, which have internalized principles and aspects of the Court of Justice's approach and may continue to have regard to ECJ case law as persuasive judgments. It is up to Parliament to decide if this is a problem. However, the effects on the judiciary of the EU way should become less important with time as UK legislation will gradually build on and partly supersede the residue of EU legislation. Third, what is the role of the Court of Justice in dispute settlements under any EU-UK trade deal? 
Disputes arising under any trade agreement between the EU and the UK will require a tribunal. It is obvious that this tribunal should not be the Court of Justice. However, problems may arise if the UK wishes to retain access to the single market for goods and services, which is based on the principles of mutual recognition and passporting for financial services. In this case, a separate court may be set up, as it has been in relation to the EEA, the European Economic uh, uh, Area, where disputes arising in the non-EU members of that area are uh, uh, decided in, uh, by their national courts or the so-called EFTA court. But the problem is that the EFTA court is, to all intents and purposes, required to follow the relevant case law of the Court of Justice. So in this case, a separate court has been set up, but if the EEA model is, is adopted, that court will be bound to follow the case law of the Court of Justice on single market legislation. If a different model, if it is a model at all, along Swiss lines is adopted, the arrangements might be more flexible. In the Swiss case, there is no court uh, that could um, uh, adjudicate uh, 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 disputes arising from the uh, number of agreements that exist between Switzerland and the EU. Um, but the EU will undoubtedly, even in such a scenario, insist on single market legislation being followed as interpreted by the Court of Justice. This will, I think, be a major obstacle in securing any trade deal with the EU which would give the UK single market issue. My fourth point concerns the ECR. I propose to say nothing on it, because um, unless Britain decides to withdraw from the ECHR, uh, her obligations under that convention are unaffected by the withdrawal from the um, European Union. Thank you. Next, Professor Richard Eakins, Director of the Policy Exchange's Judicial Power Project. There is a paper at the back, which you're all welcome to collect. That would mean that he won't be speaking for as long as his paper. But <laughs> if I tell you that it's all the judiciary's fault that Brexit has happened at all, is on, on the first page, you may find it interesting. Richard. Thank you. Well, I hope it is interesting. Uh, it's certainly not my proposal that uh, Brexit can be attributed entirely to the courts. Uh, complex, um, complex situation. Uh, let me thank Lord Judge for, for very kindly chairing today's proceedings and thank the, the panellists for uh, joining me and all of you for taking time out of a, a lovely sunny day to come and talk about the law and the constitution. I should uh, thank Julie and Amy, Charlotte and the other staff here at Policy Exchange for uh, making this all possible today. Well, I certainly won't be taking you through the entire paper and some of you will have found the paper on your seat, and for others, uh, it's available at the back if you want to see it, and online now as well, I believe. But I want just to mention uh, uh, a few points that arise from it. So I want to say a little bit about the legal challenges that are now underway before our courts, and then talk um, for the remainder of my time about the future of judicial power after Brexit, what Brexit means for the future of judicial power in our constitution. Like many other academic lawyers, I think the current challenges that are, have been moved before the courts are misconceived. And that's a view shared, I should add, amongst academic lawyers who certainly don't all uh, adopt my um, position on judicial power in general. And the reason I think it's misconceived and should fail before the court is that the European Communities Act 1972 takes for granted Britain's membership of the treaties, takes for granted also, relies upon, in fact, the continuing exercise of the prerogative. And the prerogative can be used to initiate a process, a treaty process, or process under a treaty in the way that Article 50 sets out. Now, this doesn't mean uh, plainly that Parliament will not be involved in the process of Brexit. At some point, at, at a bare minimum, it will be required to make changes to the European Communities Act itself if Brexit is to, to take place uh, or to be effected um, coherently. But there's nothing legally or constitutionally improper about the government initiating the Article 50 process itself. By all means, there should be public debate uh, a fair bit of that going on, but a uh, debate in the Commons, uh, at a minimum, about the government's plans, about its timing in relation to Article 50. But there is, in this, uh, this situation, this unusual situation, very little prospect of the government surprising Parliament. Parliament enacted the European Union Referendum Act 2015, inviting the British people to uh, decide the question of membership of the European Union. 
And it's unremarkable in one sense that a government that enjoys the ongoing confidence of the Commons would act using its existing legal powers on the basis of the outcome of that vote. Now, of course, anyone is free in our, um, our polity to initiate legal proceedings, and there is an arguable claim here. I think it's wrong, but it's arguable. But it's a claim that puts the courts in a difficult position, a position where they could be perceived, uh, depending on how it proceeds, uh, perceived to be lending aid to attempts at delay, attempts to otherwise frustrate Brexit. It's plainly not a good thing for the reputation of the courts, not a good thing for social trust in our constitutional order more generally. So I hope they reject the challenges clearly and promptly, and that they leave to the Houses of Parliament the task of holding the government to account for its proposed actions. Well, let me turn to what this all means, what Brexit will mean for the future of judicial power. And that does require a little consideration of what EU membership has meant uh, up till now for judicial power. I don't propose to address the record of the Court of Justice, save to say that uh, our courts have plainly not always been happy with the way the Court of Justice proceeds. Indeed, in two remarkable recent cases uh, over the last few years, the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, has tried to carve out grounds on which the courts might, in extremists, resist the incorporation, the adoption of the Court of Justice's jurisprudence. Now, uh, I wasn't sure, as uh, was the case of many other lawyers, and I think the Supreme Court itself, that this attempt was likely to succeed, and the, the prospect of Brexit largely makes it moot. But it does confirm attention, it confirms the concerns our courts have long had about the Court of Justice's uh, mode of operation. But that's not the whole story, because membership of the European Union has had a significant impact on the way our judges, British judges, uh, think about their role, their constitutional role. They have become accustomed to the idea that acts of parliament can be set aside when in conflict with European law. And to be clear, that's not a power grab on the part of domestic judges. It's uh, a sheer consequence of parliament's choices, parliament's ongoing choices. I think Factor Tame was rightly decided. But it's an arrangement that's changed and uh, over, over time especially changed the way British judges have thought about their position. And it spurred the expansion of judicial power beyond the scope of EU law. And I should say it's not just uh, uh, an idiosyncratic view of mine to this effect. Lord Newberger, um, President of the Supreme Court, has said exactly the same, trying to explain rather than justify the expansion of judicial power, which he sees. He's argued that the practice of overruling primary legislation by reference to EU law has supported a new judicial mindset. And you find similar remarks in Lady Hale's argument that the rule of law is on the rise and parliamentary sovereignty is in, in the decline. Not very recent remarks, I should add, but if you go back a year or two, uh, and for many years before that, one finds this argument. And the principal ground on which she relies for this argument is the fact of EU membership. And the high point of this, this whole line of discussion uh, was an attempt in a very significant case, Jackson and the Attorney General, uh, it's an attempt by several members of the House of Lords, Judicial Committee of the House of Lords, to assert that parliamentary sovereignty is no longer the law, that it's been overtaken by a succession of events, including, um, first and foremost, the fact of membership of the European Union. Now, that was never a plausible argument, I think. Lord Bingham trenchantly criticised it extrajudicially, uh, but it continued to have a, an afterglow, if you like, in the, uh, in the jurisprudence, in the case law, the extrajudicial commentary. And Brexit should bring that to an end. Whether it does, of course, remains to be seen. Well, what does this mean more generally for judicial power in our constitution? Well, many of the arguments that have been made against the Court of Justice's role and EU membership also hold in relation to the European Court of Human Rights, the Strasbourg Court, and ECHR membership. An overmighty court, not very strictly bound by legal materials, often frustrating national policy, maybe especially in relation to borders and migration. Much of Britain's migration law is uh, heavily framed by uh, surprising readings of Article 8 of the ECHR. Now, very important differences, of course. It is easier, much easier, maybe, for the political authorities to resist a decision of the Strasbourg Court than of the Court of Justice. But there's a similarity of, of mode of argument here, which might suggest if one takes Brexit seriously, one considers withdrawal from the ECHR. Now, having said that, it might be highly unwise to undertake that course of action at present. And it might be politically impossible, too strains on the United Kingdom that are arising and will continue to persist, one expects, from Brexit are intense and there's not going to be a lot of political capital to go around, um, spare political capital, one thinks. It might be more promising for uh, British authorities to resist problematic um, European Court of Human Rights rulings more often than they do. 
and to do so on the grounds, in fact, that the Supreme Court contemplated in relation to the Court of Justice, namely rulings that compromise a fundamental part of the British Constitution, or especially rulings that are ultra vires the Convention itself, uh, which is especially important in view of the Strasbourg Court's treatment of the Convention as a living instrument. Now, this might not be first and foremost a matter for domestic courts. It might be a matter for Parliament for, for the government to rely upon. Assuming no withdrawal from the ECHR, which I think is, is uh, what one should assume, what will Brexit mean for uh, how judges proceed? It could encourage them to abandon the mindset that Lord Newberger diagnosed and to become more restrained in their dealings with statutory interpretation in general, the review of executive action, more respect for Parliament's decisions, more respect for existing executive prerogatives. But it's possible that exactly the opposite will happen. Many judges and lawyers will think that Parliament is now dangerously unbound, that the executive is more and more dominant, especially if the opposition remains in a uh, difficult state. And so it falls then, one might think, to the courts to fill the vacuum. And that's an important consideration because Lord Newberger, uh, diagnosing the rise of judicial power, noted another factor in that rise, beyond EU membership, was the judicial perception the executive is ever more dominant. Parliamentary power is on the wane, the courts need to fill the vacuum. I don't think that's a good justification for the expansion of judicial power. I'm not sure Lord Newberger does either. I think it is an explanation, however. And it means that while Brexit may bring to an end uh, a direct uh, constituent part of the problem of excess judicial power, the direct role of the Court of Justice, it may have unintended side effects that exacerbate the problem in other ways. And so those side effects will require continuing attention and action. Professor Harlow to speak next, as she's making her way to the lectern. The timetable that I have heard is that the Article 50 proceedings will be heard in October uh, before a court presided over by the Lord Chief Justice. Whether it will then, presumably, will then, whatever the outcome, go to the Supreme Court, I rather anticipate it might go by way of a, a leapfrog appeal straight to the Supreme Court. And if it does that, the Supreme Court ought to be able to deal with it before the end of the the end of this year. Quite where that will be in the context of Article 50 and its invocation remains to be seen. Angela Merkel seems to be talking with, on one side, and Monsieur Hollande, I saw today, <laughs> talking on another. <laughs> Professor Hart. Um, Richard, when he asked me to talk at this meeting, offered me the impossible brief of answering three rather difficult questions in eight minutes which I am unable to do. So I can dispose of his first question, which concerns the judicial role in Brexit, simply by saying that I'm first a firm believer in the political constitution, and as in, in consequence, I'm content to stand with the blog of Sir Stephen Laws, who I feel, as a former head of the Office of Parliamentary Council, probably knows a great deal more than I do about the relationship between government and parliament. So they both, he concludes with Professor Mark Elliott, that it would be legal for the government to rely solely on the prerogative powers to trigger Article 50, but politically naive to do so. <clears throat> and I also echo Stephen Laws in saying, I hope and expect that the courts will exercise restraint and not arrogate to themselves the task of defining and so limiting the nature of Parliament's proper relationship with government. Um, I would remind them, therefore, of the re-smog um, decision which followed um, the uh, uh, decision to sign to the Maastricht Treaty. <coughs> Sorry. The second question um, covers, I think, um, much that was said by Dr Beck, because it was, has the Court of Justice contributed to Brexit? To which I would simply answer yes, inevitably so, because the Court of Justice has the last word on the interpretation of EU law, and its mission, as now defined in Article 19.1 of the Treaty of European Union, is to ensure that in the interpretation and application of the treaties, the law is observed. And uh, writing about that many years ago, Martin Shapiro said that the member states put in place, a, I think he said a cat, and when they let the cat out of the bag, it turned on them. 
and they were surprised. So in domestic law, our courts are bound by section three of the European Communities Act here after the 1972 Act, and that provides that uh, for references to the Court of Justice um, where there's a question of interpretation about the treaties or any EU instrument. Otherwise, the court can decide the case in accordance with principles of um, uh, laid down by the Court of Justice. And I can't imagine, as Richard, I think, said, that the 1972 Act will be repealed until a very late stage in Brexit negotiations. Um, of course, as Dr Beck has said, there are very many principles which impinge on national law, and to mention only three very significant ones. Uh, one, the so-called primacy rule, that EU law takes precedence over all types of national law, including the constitution, a judge, uh, the national constitution, and that is a judge-made law. The principle that national legislation must be disapplied, which caused the UK to wake up after the fact attained decision, and the Marleasing principle that national legislation must be interpreted so as to be compatible with EU law. Clearly, those are things which, um, impin which led to uh, or helped to lead to the idea um, that there was an impingement on national sovereignty. And when we add to that that um, EU law generally is enforceable first through the power to bring infringement proceedings, later reinforced by the possibility of heavy fines, and secondly through the principle of member state liability, which became the issue in the fact obtained um, case, um, it is clear that there must be some effect and impact. Generally speaking, it is agreed that the effect of European Union has been to strengthen executive power <coughs> throughout the member states and empower the judiciary. And the Court of Justice has undoubtedly played a more significant part than we in the United Kingdom might expect and a more um, active role in, Euro in European integration than we're accustomed to see in our own courts. It is, as Dr Beck um, told us, and which I'd like to underline, an unusually powerful court, um, because an American scholars often compare its policy-making capacity only to that of the US Supreme Court. Um, it's a court, as he said, with low accountability. There's no appeal from it, and again, as he said, it's very difficult indeed to erase its jurisprudence through political action and um, attempts to fight back against the Court of Justice politically have usually failed. And uh, here I can mention, uh, I would only mention the attempted strike back by the British government after the fact attained decision when it proved impossible to get consensus for reform in the council. In contrast, parliaments have been squeezed by European Union, not only our own um, Parliament, but in other states such as Denmark, the Netherlands and the United Kingdom with strong traditions of parliamentary democracy. And although the Lisbon Treaty tried to find a place for national parliaments in EU policy making, yellow and orange cards, if I have that right, I'm not a football player, um, they have not so far been very effective. So, on to the third question in two parts. What might Brexit mean for judicial power in the UK? And I can only sketch some things that we might like to think about. Assuming that the 1972 Act will remain in force, then Section 2 as well as Section 3 of the Act will remain in force, and that will mean that directly effective EU regulations will continue to take effect in the UK without further enactment that other instruments, very loose terminology there, does not take, they will not take effect directly, but um, like directives, they can be implemented by the government using, in or, or using order and council, 
and I'll come back to that point. And this would include, of course, uh, Court of Justice rulings. So there's certainly uh, scope for an impact during this period on UK law. Uh, and uh, in addition to the cases Dr Beck mentioned, I'd mention the significant case of Digital Rights Ireland, which shows the sort of way this might operate, in which the Court of Justice ruled that the uh, data retention directive, um, EU directive, was invalid because it contravened the Charter of Fundamental Rights. <coughs> As we know, our government, um, which expressed concern about the validity of the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act 2000, introduced a bill that became called uh, uh, DRIPER and became um, the, the subsequent Data Retention and Investigatory Powers Act in 2014, and that added to the list of situations where public authorities could obtain and use communications data added national security. Somewhat ironically, in view of political events, uh, David Davis um, challenged um, Dryper on the ground that it violated EU law. There were others involved, um, including Tom Watson. And the Court of Appeal actually used the preliminary reference procedure to refer to questions concerning the ambit and application of Digital Rights Ireland to UK law. And those questions are currently before the Court of Justice. And the Advocate General, whose name is, it is entirely beyond my capacity to pronounce, um, has just delivered an opinion. He says that data retention may be compatible with EU law, but only subject to the requirements of EU law as established by the Charter and subject to the court's um, usual proportionality requirements in a very uh, complex formula, which I won't go into. So that uh, area, I think, will continue to be important. I'll say why later. <coughs> Other areas in which there might be an indirect impact of the Court of Justice uh, concern Eurozone activity. Um, I confirm <laughs> there what Dr. Um, Beck said, and um, a case in point is the short-selling uh, case, which was not actually technically a Eurozone uh, case, where the UK or and Chancellor of the Exchequer argued unsuccessfully that too much executive discretion had been handed to the EU ban banking agency and lost. Again, Dr. Beck mentioned the hotly political area of welfare rights of EU citizens and the case in which the Court of Justice ruled in favour of the UK in infringement proceedings brought against us um, by the Commission. But, notably, the Court, in dismissing the infringement proceedings, ruled that the benefits were social security benefits within the meaning of EU law. And as this reflects a number of rulings on social security and on EU nationality, which are subject areas that are <coughs> primarily considered in the UK, I think, to be within the competence of member states, this is another area where there may continue to be impingements of Court of Justice jurisprudence. What could courts do to lessen the impact on UK law well, they could decline to make a preliminary reference, as was uh, notably done in the HS2 case. And, um, but if they did so, they might have to bear in mind that under Kobler and the Republic of Austria, member state liability applies to the, the rulings of national courts. So there could, in theory, be the risk of costly infringement proceedings, even if we are on our way out of the European Union. After repeal of the, um, uh, of the 1972 Act, much of what will happen is clearly entirely speculative, and I just have a few um, suggestions. First, uh, obviously, the UK will wish to maintain in force the bulk of EU law and um, will continue 
to interact in many areas with EU law if, for example, we negotiate a trade deal or an agreement giving us access to EU data banks, which seems quite likely, and then we shall almost certainly have to conform to EU law reverting back um, to um, the decisions that I've just discussed. <coughs> um, I thought that our courts might approach the interpretation of EU law either they might reasonably decide that inter well, they might reasonably decide that interpretation of EU law in Court of Justice decisions anti-dating Brexit should be either binding or as good as binding, a mirror principle. They might continue to treat post-Brexit jurisprudence as binding in respect of EU law, and they might install the principle of Section 3 of the Human Rights Act and agree to take into account Court of Justice jurisprudence. But my own preferred solution would be a statutory amendment, as was actually debated in the context of the Immigration Act 2014, directing UK courts to take into account or take into consideration or to consider relevant case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union the European Court of Human Rights and superior common law Commonwealth courts because to me a pleasant side effect of Brexit ought to be a strengthening of the unity of the common law and closer relationships with long-term legal partners. I think that in two areas Brexit might mean an influx of litigation and hard mental work for our courts First, because much of the work in the big competition and merger cases has been done for us by the Court of Justice, and it's been suggested to me by someone who lost quite heavily out of the Sony decision in the Court of Justice, that only the Court of Justice and possibly the US Supreme Court are actually strong enough to, to deal with litigation by bodies such as Google, Apple, and the major banking institutions which uh, operate uh, very um, expensive and complex litigation strategies. Second point, Brexit will inevitably raise complicated problems over the competence of devolved parliaments in areas which return from EU law, notably perhaps, and I speak from ignorance here, in agriculture and social services. Uh, and in cases involving human rights, there may very well be difficult questions to answer, such as recently arose in the case concerning the recovery of medical costs for asbestos diseases Wales bill, which the Supreme Court recently decided. In conclusion, I can't actually see Brexit as posing insuperable problems for our courts, in which I have very great confidence, except in the event that it would result in the breakup of the United Kingdom and Scottish independence or changes in the delicate balance of the constitutional arrangements in Northern Ireland might create a truly serious threat to the established and largely successful hierarchy of courts within the UK and might even result in the dismantling of the present Supreme Court. In my view, well, I dread that, and I would hope that in such a very undesirable position, we would look back to the precedent of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council as a final appeal court and arbiter of the common law in the United Kingdom. <laughs> Professor Lee. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm here to celebrate uh, the interaction of academia, uh, the practice of law and politics in our constitutional culture and to reflect on particularly the words we use and the images uh, we conjure up. I'm very pleased to be here at Policy Exchange for a number of reasons. Uh, one being that my nearest to a claim to fame is being mentioned in a book by Dean Godson. 
uh, half a sentence in the biography of my former colleague at Queen's, David Trimble. Since I wasn't important enough to be in the index, I didn't realize I was mentioned uh, when I bought the book and for some time afterwards because it was a long way in. But I I'm pleased to be here. And in a way, I, I want to agree with, with the Lord Judge at the beginning. It's, it's what uh, my professors at Yale, Bruce Ackerman, would have called a high constitutional moment that we're in. And it is a bit like the smaller but more intense setting of Northern Ireland, where I was during the Troubles and the beginning of the peace process, where you did feel that people were interested in the culture, uh, the interaction between academics uh, at law and politics. So uh, everybody knows that Lord Denning told us in 1974, in the case of Bormann and Bollinger, that the treaty, meaning the Treaty of Rome, is like an incoming tide. It flows into the estuaries and up the rivers. It cannot be held back. This is such a good metaphor, uh, or dazzling simile, as Lord Scarman called it, that Lord Denning, of course, went back to it. Uh, in uh, 1978, in, in a case called Shields and Coombs, he said, the flowing tide of community law is coming in fast. It has not stopped at high water mark. It has broken the dikes and the banks. It has submerged the surrounding land. So much that we have to learn to become amphibious if we wish to keep our heads above water. Uh, and there we left watery metaphors until policy exchange, judicial power, and John Finnis came back to them with a vengeance uh, last year. John Finnis was talking about water cascading under the bridge and us being left adrift with flagship cases which were shipwrecks. Picking up on that, uh, in Richard's paper, you can see some comment about some of the blogs which academic lawyers who uh, voted remain and can't believe uh, that the public voted to leave have been coming up with, objecting to everything. Uh, I, I voted remain, but uh, I understand that that side lost. Um, and David Runciman, in the London Review of Books, put it well, he more or less said, get over it. He said, uh, 17 million is an awful lot of people to be wrong. Uh, they can't all be suckers or closet racists, uh, and they're not all ignorant. Uh, and so it was 52 to 48, but that was the, the margin for Obama. Uh, and so don't go on about it was a narrow margin either. But anyway, there's a lot of whinging. Uh, and if I use the Strand as an example, it's not just King's or the LSE nearby or the Royal Courts of Justice or the Temple or the Law Society, but uh, that can stand for academia more generally. There's a poem in the 1880s, William Sharp, called The Ebbing Tide. And it begins, a long, low gurgle down the strand, the sputtering of the drying rack, the tide is slowly ebbing back with listless murmuring from the land, and so on. That's really what's going on at the moment uh, in the blogs of academic lawyers. Or, or to give examples from before the referendum, one of my old tutors, Chris McCrudden, uh, said that it would be an unmitigated disaster if we were to leave uh, in this referendum, if it was to be a vote to leave. Uh, I suppose you could say, but for academics, it, the, the point is to try and mitigate the disaster, if you think it is a disaster. Uh, and it's interesting that academics are very caught up now with impact in a thing called REF, Research Excellence Framework, in which all the law schools try to claim that some case note or article on some case had an enormous impact because some judge realized that they were wrong and then came to the conclusion of the academic, usually because they were good friends with that academic. But here, so huge swathes of academia have, have, have failed to have impact. Uh, and uh, it would be helpful if in the next ref exercise you could get minus marks for, <laughs> for instance, the LSE Commission on the Future of Britain in Europe, an enormous amount of work, 11 hearings and so on and so forth, concluded uh, the evidence of his own report was measured. It said it suggests the least risky voters for the UK to remain in the European Union. Well, that's an enormous amount of work rejected by uh, the British public. Uh, and and I, I think that there is a need for some humility on our part in this. But we do have a role, and, and in my own case, it's sometimes been pointing out very basic things about the rhetoric. For instance, earlier in this debate, in February, in the, uh, the main debate in Parliament on, on the referendum, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg teased and taunted the Prime Minister, the then Prime Minister, by saying, is the government's policy basically always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse? Yeah? 
Uh, and uh, I pointed out, which had no impact at all, that uh, he was quoting Belloc, that he seemed to forget what happened in the, in the rhyme, which was, little Jim let go of nurse and got eaten by a lion. <laughs> and instead of pointing that out, David Cameron said, but uh, to exit would be a leap in the dark, in turn forgetting that that phrase in Parliament was used by the Earl of Derby backing up Disraeli on uh, extending the franchise uh, in the Second Reform Act. In other words, it's a good thing. So you could go on and on and on about uh, our culture, but I want to say a few words to, to the right and to the left, uh, and then bring it back to, to us academics. To the right, uh, talking about the cat being out of the bag, now that Theresa May is the Prime Minister, one of the most important uh, cases is apparently this one about a cat. Uh, if you remember, you may recall as recently as April, the Prime Minister was in favour of coming out of the European Convention. And in a Conservative uh, Party conference uh, speech, she said, in, in a Blair-like set of sentences without verbs, British values and institutions, the rule of law, democracy, equality, free speech, and respect for minorities. That's what it's all about. And she gave another example of the problems with the European Convention of Human Rights culture in saying that uh, somebody couldn't be deported because of their cat. Uh, and then the media pointed out that this wasn't really completely the full story. I've been reading the cat's judgments. Yeah, this cat, by the way, in the appeal, is, is anonymized. Uh, <laughs> se senior judges in the celebrity injunction case have taken to anonymizing almost everything. Uh, and you get square brackets. But I can reveal the real name of the cat <laughs> is uh, May, uh, as in Theresa May, May, uh, uh, or Maya. Uh, and what the original immigration judge actually said was, the evidence concerning the joint acquisition of Maya by the appellant and his partner reinforces my conclusion on the strength and quality of the family life that the appellant and his partner enjoy. In Canada and the United States, there is an increasing recognition of the significance that pets occupy in family life and of the potentially serious emotional consequences pet owners may suffer when some unhappy event terminates the bond they have with their pet. And then, rather unfortunately, the, the appeal immigration senior judge was really, I think, ha trying to have fun, which perhaps wasn't very sensible, uh, and then says, um, the cat, brackets, need no longer fear having to adapt to Bolivian mice. But anyway, I, I want to suggest that instead of going on about uh, the cat, uh, there are some good cases which have been forgotten, but in the spirit of going back to the 70s with the European Communities Act and so on and so forth, uh, there are some important cases which give the flavour of where, how judicial, judicial power can be used rightly uh, and isn't just a question uh, of the European Convention or uh, the European Union law. Uh, and the case that, that I've written about recently from 1975, exactly the time of the referendum that I also voted Remain in, um, is Crown and Home Secretary ex parte Fan Sopka and Begum. Uh, there were two women, one from India, one from Bangladesh, who had patrial rights to come into the UK. And the government was saying, no, you, have, you can't come into Heathrow. You have to get, uh, you have to have your certificates shown and so on back in uh, Bombay, Mumbai, or Dhaka. Uh, and I just want to make the point that the Court of Appeal said that the Home Office was wrong. I think this is a good exercise of, of judicial power. Uh, they invoked Magna Carta, justice delayed, justice denied. Uh, a couple of them referred to the European Convention on Human Rights. Lord Scarman, uh, for instance, referred to the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, but the Home Secretary was Roy Jenkins. His special advisor was Anthony Lester. His counsel was Harry Wolfe. You know, these are the icons of civil liberties, human rights, they were very busy on race and sex discrimination. And yet, they were being difficult with women who had the right to come in, and they were saying, you've got to go and wait 14 months, even though nobody in their position had ever been refused. It was just a delaying tactic. So it isn't simply about cats and Bolivia and so on and so forth, but there is a balance to be struck in this constitutional uh, conversation. And I, I could give lots of examples, but I also want to give an example of a statute that is ignored by judges and politicians at the moment. A very simple one, and it's relevant to the next debate. Uh, the Human Rights Act 1998, lots of people are in favour of it, come what may. If I can use the word may there. Uh, 
But the actual wording of it in section 12 and section 13 says that judges must have particular regard to two rights, freedom of expression and freedom of religion. They're in there because the government couldn't have got it through Parliament without them for all sorts of reasons, you know, the media pressure on the freedom of expression, uh, Cardinal Hume and others with the Anglican bishops uh, on freedom of religion. And so uh, those texts are in there, but they don't sit easily because the idea of the European Convention is that those rights would only have the same status as other rights. And so the solution is to ignore them. And so when people say uh, we should or shouldn't uh, change the Human Rights Act, it's useful to kind of focus on these sorts of examples. And you can see a case coming from Northern Ireland, uh, that is to say, the gay cake case. Uh, we're about to have judgment from the Court of Appeal, no doubt we'll go to the Supreme Court, where you can see those two rights in action. It'll be interesting to see how that happens. So, uh, my point is that we are in a kind of big debate, a dialogue. It is important to attend to the wording of decisions, uh, to, to challenge the use of metaphors. Uh, and I think that there is a role for academic lawyers. Uh, it's not just the research, which I mentioned at the beginning, but also in the straightforward teaching. Uh, I was taught four subjects as an undergraduate in tutorials by uh, somebody sometimes described as the greatest living legal philosopher, Joseph Raz. Nobody would describe him as the greatest English constitutional lawyer, administrative lawyer, or European lawyer, but he did teach me those four subjects, constitutional law, administrative law, jurisprudence, and European law. This was in uh, the late 1970s. Uh, and uh, the kind of problem question we were set in the exams by Bernard Rudden uh, shows the kind of spirit of the course in those days. Uh, the problem standard problem question was, you were skiing down a skim milk powder mountain and fell over and injured your leg, could you sue the European community? Those are the big questions. But uh, the, the questions that Joseph Raz, who writes about legal systems, the rule of recognition was addressing, uh, included these ones about, well, what would happen if we left uh, what was then the European community, now the European Union. And uh, Lord Scarman, in his famous lectures, English Law, The New Dimension, writing in 74, says, if we stay in the common market, I would expect certain things to change. Because this was in the, uh, the run-up to that referendum in 1975. So, I want to say that all that stuff about what it is to withdraw, to have the ebbing tide, is something which I was thinking about in the 1970s. As a final uh, comment on that, in my college at the same time, other people were doing other things. Uh, there was, for instance, the president of the Oxford Union, Damien Green, now Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Uh, there was the hard left uh, organiser of the junior common room, Seamus Milne, now advising Jeremy Corbyn on strategy and communications. And there was in the law library uh, for his doctorate, Robert Reed, now uh, next door at the Supreme Court of Justice. I think we're all touched by our education, reflecting on this phrase, the rule of law, reflecting on the challenge of a legal system then acquiring a new dimension and now seeing that dimension ebb away. Thank you very much. Well, it is half past five. If you want to go, please do. If, on the other hand, you'd like to stay and ask some questions and listen to the answers, please stay. Well, that's very good. You go first. Would you mind saying who you are, or what you, where you're from, or whether you're an academic and practicing lawyer or whatever, so that we all know your, where you I come from? Shall I stand up? If you stand up, I'm There's sure a voice can carry. Coming towards you. Oh, uh, don't worry. Try, try without it. And, and turn, if you turn around and let the people at the back hear, we'll pick it up. Um, that's fine. I'm Jeremy Thomas. In the latter case, how far would that 
so much in here. <laughs> Thank you. Richard. Well, I'll, I'll give a brief answer and then if uh, Dr. Beck wants to give a comprehensive one, you can. Uh, I mean, the Charter provides for <coughs> limitation on certain of the rights which are framed in very general terms. As limited, however, they are um, incapable of, of being departed from as a matter of EU law. As a matter of domestic British law, if Parliament wants to tell, uh, wants to, to do otherwise than is, is required, it can do so. It just places the United Kingdom in a great deal of difficulty with the European Union, which is part of the reason uh, for, uh, for Brexit. Um, but I'm not sure what more one can say than that. I mean, there's an argument, uh, sort of Simon mentioned that academic lawyers are coming up with inventive new arguments every day. <laughs> there was another one today, which was uh, the Charter, EU law includes the Charter of Rights. The Charter of Rights is very important. Therefore, before the government can do anything that would make the Charter of Rights uh, no longer hold, it must have an express act of Parliament telling it that it must do. To my mind, this is, this is no different to all the other arguments. The Charter is part of EU law, and um, uh, the way EU law comes to bear in our law is by way of the European Communities Act, which takes for granted there are the treaties out there, uh, and if the, the, um, the government uses its capacity under a treaty to bring those um, treaties to, to a close, the European Communities Act makes provision for that. Uh, so I don't think it adds anything to my mind, <coughs> but if you want a, a more detailed answer on the, the Charter. Dr. Beck, three sentences. Uh, that was fairly comprehensive. Yes. <laughs> I can always add to that. Um, I suspect uh, uh, by inalienable, you mean that they would somehow survive British uh, departure from the European Union. Um, <coughs> the answer to that is no, because the uh, charter in its horizontal provi uh, provision states quite clearly that it applies only to the Union institutions and the member states when they are implementing um, Union law. So it is not the fount of a general human rights jurisdiction. Thank you. First, and then at the, there's somebody at the back. Um, you next, please. Uh, my name's Jane Cross. I'm a former accredited lobbyist of the European Parliament, which is one of my greatest achievements. Um, I work in financial service area. I'm not a lawyer, but my understanding is even if we leave the European Union, we'll still have to adopt EU legislation without um, fiscal oversight on that? Uh, well, that will depend on the arrangement Britain and uh, the EU finally adopt and agree on. Um, assuming uh, an arrangement uh, is, is, is agreed whereby uh, Britain um, retains access to the uh, single market in the sense that goods can uh, continue to trade pretty much as they do now and financial services be offered uh, transnationally, then it is, I mean, that was the point I was allude alluding to in my concluding remarks. It's very difficult. I mean, that such an arrangement exists under the EEA, i.e. in uh, the EU's trade relations with Norway being the most important, uh, Liechtenstein and Iceland. Um, and in such a, 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 an agreement exists which allows for precisely such single market access. Now, um, there is a special court set up to deal with disputes that arise in the non-EU EA member states, for reasons of simplicity, let's say Norway in lieu, uh, lieu of uh, uh, EA member states. Now. Um, if such a, uh, the EFTA court uh, uh, decides such disputes, but under something like, I think, Article 106 of the EEA agreement, it is bound to have regard to the decisions of the Court of Justice. So the short answer is that if Britain um, wishes to retain access to the single market, um, an obstacle would be that the EU would almost certainly insist on the uh, implementation of uh, EU legislation, um, and that would imply that future Court of Just uh, Justice judgments um, would determine how this legislation is to be construed. Well, Can I just add part, one yeah. thing? There could be considerable um, indirect impact of EU law for example, when I was in Australia, 
I found that um, lawyers had a great deal of work advising on the EU and particularly its regulatory and administrative law uh, and that again um, involved rules about interpretation although obviously Australia isn't a signatory to those treaties. So in the modern world where we have these incredibly difficult trade ag agreements, um, the impact of courts could be the dispute resolution um, system in the World Trade or Organization. They have uh, inevitable impact. In uh, Bulmer and Bollinger, the, the Lord Denning case, by the way, Bollinger didn't win. <coughs> he came back in 78 and didn't win again, this time complaining about baby sham. Uh, but last year, the Australian courts dealt with a case where France, uh, the Champagne region, had a bilateral agreement with Australia, uh, and they were complaining about a woman calling herself Champagne Jane. And uh, again, they didn't win completely, but they, they won on some of those points. But there's a huge bilateral trade negotiation on whether you can call Australian sparkling wine Champagne. There's a hand raised at the back first, and then I've got the voice here, and then I'll come to you. Um, Paul Tucker, Harvard, um, chairman of the Systemic Risk Council. Do you mind also standing? Um, oh, sorry. Carry best, um, Paul Tucker, you. Harvard, Thank chairman you. of the Systemic Risk Council. I used to be a central um, banker. I, in the 40-odd in the years, we were um, a member of the EU. Executive government has been transformed. Lots, lots of it has been delegated to regulatory agencies and central central. I think you can probably speak, you, your voice carries pretty well. Um, voice. And it, uh, a couple of times, Richard in particular, but others of you as well, referred to the growth in executive dominance. And the, the broad question I'd like to put to you is, and to Dean in a way, is when you talk about judicial power, whereas you know me and I share your reservations, why don't you accompany it with concern about executive um, power and the way and the kind of restoration of parliamentary power and the reason the two I think are linked is that if we remain where we are executive power so ministers being able through secondary legislation effectively to repeal parts of outdated or cumbersome burdensome primary regulatory legislation um, isn't that more likely to end up in the courts um, than if those decisions were taken in Parliament itself. Put another way, if those who are nervous about judicial power hanker after political constitutionalism rather than legal constitutionalism, do we wish that political constitutionalism to be based in our Parliament, or are we content for it to be based in the executive, which certainly compared with when I, when I started out, tends to be concentrated in half your hands. Thank you. Richard, you go first. Uh, well, I, I agree with much of that, so I think they are, they are related, um, and the concerns, if one, if one cares about parliamentary democracy, then one should have a concern about um, the various ways in which it can be distorted, one of which I think is problematic judicial action, but another certainly is foolish choices about the design of, of government and the and parliament's choice to, uh, to authorise ministers to amend acts of parliament by, by order and so forth. Um, I, I mentioned the rise of executive government. In one way, I was reporting um, a claim made about it because, I mean, the, plainly the executive government is a complicated thing. The claim that, uh, that ministers ever more dominate um, parliament, I think, is actually uh, just, it rolls off the tongue quite nicely and it, it shows up in, in judicial lectures, but uh, it's not quite as, um, as powerful a claim as, uh, as, as all that. It's a more complicated relationship than that. Um, what you're pointing to is something a little different, I think, which is the hiving off of particular functions to, to new bodies, and one should have a very serious uh, inquiry into whether those are, uh, are sound choices or not. Um, so I think that's, that's all I'll say there. Well, I, I'm going to say something, because I've said this publicly. I think that um, I think you're entirely right. I think Parliament frequently gives far too much power to the executive, I myself would never agree to a Henry VIII clause. I simply cannot see why if a, a Henry VIII clause which involves the repeal of an existing act of parliament should be done through the parliamentary process. I've been told on all sides this is completely unrealistic, government couldn't work, but I simply don't accept it. 
Nobody else is allowed to suspend statute. Nobody else is allowed to dispense with statute. Parliament dispense with statute. Parliament reforms statute. It will be Parliament, I hope, that will decide that we're going to repeal the European Communities Act. Nobody will think of putting that into a Henry VIII clause. I've said my piece on that, Mike. Michael, 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 I want to return, if I may, to the previous answer about the extent to which the United Kingdom would have to comply with EU regulations if we leave. Now, I may have misunderstood the answer. But surely, if we bear in mind the distinction between access to the single market and membership of the single market, if we're talking about access, while those companies which wish to sell goods and services into the European Union would no doubt have to comply with the standards of the European Union, just as they have to apply with the, comply with the standards of China or the United States or anywhere else. Countries which don't wish to export into the European Union would not have to comply with those regulations. So I, I, I thought the previous answer implied that the country as a whole would have to retain the standards and, and regulations of the European Union. Surely that would not be the case. That's correct. It would. Uh uh, single market uh, legislation will be relevant in so far as it uh, is relevant to a trade agreement between the United Kingdom and the EU. Is that any clearer? I mean, I'm quite sure that the way I phrased it initially, perhaps now, didn't necessarily clarify the matter. I was talking primarily about the EEA agreement, where yeah, okay, fine. That's, I mean, it, yeah, quite. There could be two different situations. First, that uh, general agreement, if the country decided to enter into it. But secondly, we could be in the position of Australia, which is what you've described. Yes, you're next. Um, <coughs> Michael, I Philip Johnson, I'm the Chief Legal 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 Telegraph. Um, could I ask... The assumption seems to be, and I think Professor Harlow said the same, that this repeal would come at the end of the process rather than at the beginning of the process. Uh, looking back at the 75 referendum, um, it would appear that the Labour government had proposals to repeal it immediately upon uh, those decisions leaving, which of course didn't happen, and then perhaps there was only we were only in it for two years then, so perhaps it wasn't so much well allowed. But why can this not be done at the beginning? manifestation of Brexit, maybe with, with a, an enabling bill um, to say that we are no longer subject to the uh, PCJ. Um, and then we can negotiate the two-year period, one time for three years and leave that, even if leaving that trigger. Okay. I did think about that in, when I was um, making that remark, but I felt that actually I didn't know enough about it technically, so I simply borrowed from Sir Stephen Laws, who makes the point that it would leave, he says, unmitigated chaos, um, because it would leave in limbo all the laws, regulations, which are um, particularly um, dense in the areas of agriculture, in the a agricultural area, um, in, in a position which needed to be saved. And not being that sort of technician, I just dropped the point. So I can't answer the question. Richard. If, if we repeal, if we uh, banish the European Union <coughs> from our, our legal system, uh, and if we do that before we actually leave the treaties, then we're in breach of European Union law. Yeah, we are. And that causes a, a grave world of, of diplomatic difficulties. Um, we've not deemed all the, all the laws that have been passed since 1936. Oh, if, if you repeal Act. Like, well, if oh. your repeal act carries it on, then in one way, uh, um, well, why are you repealing it, perhaps? Um, you could repeal it uh, and just post-date the, the commencement of the repeal until the point at which the treaties end. That, that might be quite, um, quite wise, especially if you have the, the political force to do so now rather than, well, who knows what would take place in, in three or four years' time or whenever it may be. Uh, but there, you, I think you can't, simply for the reason of, of chaos, simply cancel all European Union law now, you need a complex transitional scheme. It might not be very complex, actually. It all continues until it's cancelled piece by piece. Uh, but you've got to be careful, I think, about how you conduct uh, the, the dismantling of the relationship, given the international uh, arrangement. Yeah. 
also, it might be another of those things that is legally possible but politically unwise. Yes. Yes. I'll take one last question. Flynn uh, Gaskar, the head of private justice at Policy Exchange. I just wanted to ask a, a question on uh, immigration. I think that um, this is one of the issues in the referendum. Some moves to reduce immigration as part of the EU deal, but there's been questions around the timing of that. That may encourage more people to come in before that date. There might be the, the pre um, fall Brexit surge. Um, so, my question is um, if the, uh, the fact that we're going to have to deal with this problem, if the UK government wants to do this in a process which is Could there be an emergency style break uh, in immigration in order to manage that transition? Do you think that would be possible, uh, aside from much of the politics, but just the... Uh, and then second of all, if we took an approach on immigration, as seems to be the case with trade, as to, we're going to do this, impose controls in this case, um, and um, how, do, how would the EZJ respond in that? Let me we're departing a very long way from <laughs> judicial power. Mind you, every question so far has been very far removed from judicial power, so we'll allow another political question. Go on, Richard, you go first. Well, I was simply going to suggest in a way this is related to the previous question. Uh, to what extent should, um, should Britain uh, unilaterally cancel uh, European Union law? It's always been capable of doing so. It's just had very good reason not to do so. I think it probably has pretty good reason not to do so yes. going forward um, until the point of, of actual Brexit because there's going to be a relationship amongst uh, Britain and its neighbours um, for a long time hereafter, and we hope for various um, productive agreements and so forth. Now, in one way, you can't control numbers between now and Brexit, but you can make decisions and, and publicly announce them and act with a view to them taking force upon Brexit as to the position as it will be then. And so it might well be that from today or uh, from the 31st of, of December, uh, persons who arrive um, and take up their, their rights in EU law to reside here will not enjoy the position that people who have been here you know, today or yesterday or for five or 15 years hence have had. So you can't, you can't implement that without causing a grave world of difficulty. You can certainly decide it with a view to what will take effect on Brexit. Yes, the would, um, but it's not really it's not really possible to to answer questions that are so um, that hypothetical is not perhaps the right word, but um, the only uh, suggestion that has, that I've seen made is that um, Angela Merkel would pr would like the emergency break um, solution, but it's not clear whether the council would support her, and again, that would be somewhat ironic in view of David Cameron's trip into Europe earlier, was it last year or this year? So I, I just think that's an unanswerable question at the moment. Go on, one more. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, this is going to be the, the issue Yes, it is. I mean, after Brexit, pending whatever the details of the agreement that is reached between the UK and the EU, which you know, we don't know, uh, it, it perfectly capable of Britain to decide that, and to decide now, but to implement it at that point without being subject to the Court of Justice uh, settling it. So unless we uh, bind ourselves in a certain way with an agreement as to what's going to take place later, uh, you know, the British Parliament and the government acting in accordance with Parliament's directives will be able to make its decision on that point. I may just return to the point raised by the previous question. In theory, I don't think in theory there's anything to stop Parliament repealing the 1972 Act tomorrow. No. But I think in practice, that is so improbable and the consequences would be so astonishing for our negotiating that it won't happen. And that's why I think it'll happen at the end of the process. We would also be in breach of our treaty obligations. We'd have failed 
to abide by our own obligations uh, as we accepted them. And I'm not sure that's a very good starting point for a negotiating position. Right, I think probably we've, we've done very well, but I think that you've been patient with us long enough. I want to thank on your behalf all four of our speakers. I'm sorry I didn't introduce them with the necessary courtesy. If you want to know who they are in detail, there are pages and pages about them, which Richard will put onto our website. Perhaps. And on the text of what you had to say, which will go uh, on they'll the be website. coming next week. Yeah. And so they'll all be on the website. And what you got from each of them was rather an attenuated version of what I suspect was rather a series of rather learned papers. <laughs> thank you all four very much indeed. <laughs>